Welcome everyone to Humanist Canada's 2021 webinar series. I'm Anna Popovich and I will moderate today's conversation with Kathleen Johnson. Our webinar will be 75 minutes in length with time allotted for questions at the end of the presentation. Just a reminder that you're attending in listen only mode. You can uh, submit your questions with the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen and you can also upvote your preferred question. Our topic today is Black History, Achievement, Purpose, and Progress from Ancient Africa to 2021. And we are joined by, by Kathleen Johnson. Kathleen was born in Calgary. Her parents immigrated to Canada from Grenada in 1965. Her father, Neville Wells, was the first officer of color on the Calgary Police Force. And Kathleen's mother pioneered the Congress of Black Women, Alberta chapter. Kathleen is a diversity and inclusion specialist with her firm, KMJ Coaching and Consulting, that she launched in January of this year. Her goal is to educate and facilitate meaningful inclusion in companies, organizations, and schools for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, LGBTQ, women, and the neurodiverse populations. She has co-founded Secular Humanist of Calgary and Black Non-Believers Canada. Kathleen sits as the Alberta member on Humanist Canada's board, and she has also launched a critical Black Thought Society on Facebook. This group supports those in the Black community that are questioning their faith and helps others understand atheists in an inherently religious diaspora. The group is also a safe space for all Black people, no matter their orientation, to explore issues that affect the community. Personal trials led Kathleen to the Black Evangelical Church and later Mormon faith for 13 years, but she's been an atheist for the past four years. Welcome, Kathleen. Thanks so much for joining us. And over to you. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's the last day of this month uh, for Black History Month. And so uh, it's, a, it's a special day. Um, and a lot has been going on. So um, I appreciate that uh, you're joining me. And I just want to get right into it because it there is a lot um, to share. So my, uh, my talk is called Achievement, Purpose, and Progress. And that is because uh, with Africa as the birthplace of civilization, um, there is a lot, <laughs> there's a lot to, to share um, before uh, slavery. And that's why I wanted to start with uh, Africa because quite often uh, the black community, especially in North America uh, is defined as when slavery started. And there's a lot we were doing before that. So um, uh, the, the first humans uh, came from Africa with uh, the discovery of Lucy. Australopithecus afarensis is what she was called. She was discovered in Ethiopia and it was a, a quite a well-preserved skeleton. Um, so they have a lot of information about Lucy and um, she uh, is uh, kind of our, uh, everybody's mom, I guess. She walked uh, upright, she was small-brained, but she was a uh, hominid as, uh, as we uh, are hominids today. So some notable kingdoms I just wanted uh, to highlight. I won't go into them, but uh, this is just for your own homework. Uh, they were uh, some very influential tribes in Africa that are good to know about. The Ashanti, uh, the Dogon that were quite adept at um, mathematics and charting the stars. The Mali, the Yoruba and Igbo uh, from Nigeria and the Maasai. I start with Egypt because um, Egypt was very influential in what in uh, the influencing the Greeks and the Romans who, um, as we know, kind of charted the course for the Western world. Um, Egypt is quite often uh, called the birthplace of the Western civilization. And it uh, 
I, I, I also go into Egypt because a little bit because um, it also is something that a lot of Western culture co-opted and claimed for themselves, suggesting that these people were not black. And in fact, they were. Um, so they are from what is now considered um, modern Sudan. Um, but it's interesting because there didn't seem to be a hierarchy um, as Egypt became kind of where it's situated became the uh, uh, kind of civilized hub of where uh, Europe met Africa, met the Middle East. Um, but there was no hierarchy in terms of uh, fairer skinned people over darker skinned people that they could find. Um, so as I said, they were very, um, they were very cosmopolitan and the library at Alexandria was the largest of its kind in the world. The Nile was considered an archaeological, an archaeological wonder. And uh, because it, it was kind of the first uh, evidence of crops being irrigated, that irrigated crops far and wide from it. And of course, the pyramids. Now, there is popular uh, misconception or myth that you might be aware of that ancient aliens helped the Egyptians build the pyramids, but uh, they were, you have to have quite advanced mathematical knowledge to build that. And I, maybe we just don't think that uh, people in that time had that knowledge. But um, as I said, with, when I mentioned the Dogon, there is evidence that quite uh, what we would consider, consider primitive people had this advanced knowledge of mathematics. Medicine as a discipline. So the Egyptians were actually the first people to document their medical procedure, where, whereby other people could come and build on that. So they actually created the discipline of medicine, uh, the calendar and astronomy. So the earliest evidence uh, of this dates back to stone circles um, that's called Adam's calendar. So this was the first evidence that they could find that was an attempt to uh, use astrology to map seasons and whatnot. So this is about 75,000 years old. So it predates Stonehenge by quite a bit. Um, so some inventions. Um, I like to go into this because I find that if you don't know what a people did, it's kind of harder to give them credit. It's, uh, it adds to the respect you might have for that uh, group of population. And a lot of people just don't know. Um, so just to highlight some things, um, there are uh, some things that, uh, a lot of these things are from Americans, but um, for instance, dry cleaning, uh, home security system, uh, automatically operating elevator doors. And I won't go through all of them because I don't have time, but um, there's a Dr. Shirley Jackson who invented touch tone telephone, the fax, the portable fax machine, caller ID, call waiting. Um, so you can, you can thank her for those things. Um, and just uh, also everyday things like the walker and toilet tissue holder. Um, so those are some things that uh, a black and a black uh, descending people invented. Uh, gods and goddesses. So a lot of uh, Greek and Roman mythology is kind of deriv derived from uh, Egyptian mythology. And uh, as we know, they had uh, many gods and goddesses for different things. The two of the most popular um, that they've actually linked to the uh, Jesus and Mary story is uh, Isis and Osiris, or as an Egyptian, Aset and Usir. Um, so this is a story about how, um, and as you can see, she has, before I even go into the story, you can see in the uh, imagery here, how she has, uh, it's a very kind of Jesus and Mary looking um, situation where she's got her son on her lap. Um, so the the uh, story goes uh, that uh, Horus, um, as so the living the living king was identified with Horus, a god of the sky. Osiris and Horus were father and son, and the goddess Isis was the mother. And uh, there was a god Seth that was the murderer of Osiris and the adversary of Horus. And so uh, Horus became successfully fought against Seth, avenging Osiris and becoming the new king of Egypt. Um, so unlike the uh, Christ story, however, there was no resurrection, but uh, it's like Osiris didn't resurrect, he didn't come back to life in that way. But through him, um, you could realize uh, prosperity and uh, for your crops or for your family um, and for your descendants continuing on earth. So it was this kind of, he was seen as kind of a renewance of life. 
And uh, these are images, uh, well, you couldn't see the slide before that I was referring to, but here you can see um, the image, the Egyptian image of uh, mother and child. Um, some of the first earliest Christian images of mother and child, uh, Madonna and child, and uh, the, um, the Roman version that we're most familiar with. Um, so another one that I wanted to mention was the Aksumite Empire, which uh, is now largely Ethiopia. Um, so this is early evidence, the earliest evidence of farming of 10,000 years ago. And um, as we go along, the Aksumites uh, were the first to convert as a population to Christianity. And they were, this is now in Ethiopia, where um, the Ark of the Covenant is rumored to be um, to, re to be housed in the, through the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which actually is still um, an institution in Jamaica. So the House of Solomon um, says so you have King David, Solomon, and Heli Selassie. Um, Heli Selassie was an Ethiopian dictator who claimed um, descendants who claimed that he was a descendant of the house of David, so that he was a descendant of King Solomon. Um, and he was the head of the Ethiopian empire. He was um, the last king um, of this dynasty that uh, came from, that said they came from this line. And um, he is significant as we can see going on um, further on. He was uh, born Rastafari Makonin, and I know we're probably all familiar with the Rastafarian movement in Jamaica that he inspired. And um, through him being seen as kind of a god, um, well, he was actually seen as a god uh, of the Black people, um, an actual redeemer that would um, help them get out of their bondage. And Marcus Garvey uh, followed him very closely. And Marcus Garvey being a Jamaican and Heli Selassie influencing Jamaican culture so much, um, they saw him they, as in Rastafarianism, they saw him as a god and Marcus Garvey uh, was heavily influenced by this. Now in Ethiopia, they had um, their issues with Italy and uh, Ethiopia and Italy had fought a war that Mussolini uh, felt that Ethiopia was largely responsible for. So he invaded them uh, and he first time was not successful, but the second time he uh, did um, a lot of damage in Ethiopia. And he cut the rationale he used for this was kind of to give the Italians um, some land and uh, to expand. He wanted to be a power um, and expand their territory. So he invaded Ethiopia for that reason. And this made um, this made uh, Heli Selassie flee. He was exiled. And uh, so Marcus Garvey, as said, was quite influenced by Heli Selassie. And he felt that he, Heli Selassie kind of ran away and left his people and didn't really fight the Italians. So this was kind of a disappointment to him. But um, Heli Selassie still remained very important to the Jamaican people. But um, so Marcus Garvey actually when he traveled to America, he brought this with him. And he is the father of the largest movement still to date um, in the black community. And it, there was 4 million people in his organization. And it still um, is based on uh, self-determination. And um, Booker T. Washington was an American that Garvey was starting to correspond with, which is how he came how he became uh, to, to be an American. And um, Booker T. Washington was also kind of the same vein that they didn't want to be integrated, but they wanted to have a separate and but equal society um, to the white population. So this uh, philosophy didn't really carry over well into the civil rights movement that as we know now is more focused on integration, but it did spark something. And um, so you had like a separate movement that followed from that philosophy. So when Marcus Garvey went to America, he, well, before he went to America, he studied in London and uh, he studied law and philosophy. And this is where he kind of formed the Universal Negro Improvement Association 
um, that became so huge that it landed on J. Edgar Hoover's radar at the uh, Bureau of Investigation, which is the later the FBI. Um, and they eventually nabbed him uh, on tax evasion and mail fraud and sent him back um, to Jamaica. But he actually met with the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan um, because he felt like they had similar goals where they wanted separation, but he was seeking equality. So this became the foundation of the Nation of Islam's philosophy of separate but equal. And uh, of course, Garvey um, knew the importance uh, that the Black church had, and he knew that he couldn't get um, everybody on board with his ideologies if he wasn't influential in the Black church. So he became quite influ influential um, where uh, pastors, he realized, were the most powerful people in the community. They had a lot of influence. And this was where uh, the Black church was kind of the only place where Black people had autonomy um, in white American society. And so it was uh, key to make sure that this community was on board. And uh, so he wasn't really interested in promoting hope in the afterlife. Uh, he felt that he really kind of promoted this idea in the Black church of prosperity now. And um, it's kind of the kind of the materialistic uh, social and political success of the Black church today is kind of stems from this uh, message of not waiting till you die until you're prosperous. So, um, Malcolm X's father was the one of the organizers, one of the key organizers of Marcus Garvey's um, organization in Lansing, Michigan. Um, and so later on with the uh, when when Malcolm X joined the Nation of Islam, this was a very familiar message to him because his parents were very instrumental in this organization. Um, so they believed that, uh, God was black and that he had created these uh, scientists and one scientist broke off. Um, I know this, this sounds crazy now, but um, one scientist broke off from the rest and um, he created the white race and um, they were to basically uh, dominate for 6,000 years. And then their time, when their time came up, uh, black people had to be ready with their own nation. Um, and so he viewed himself, um, Elijah Muhammad viewed himself as the last and final messenger um, of God. Now, jumping back a little bit for um, the Nation of Islam um, and those other kinds of organizations, they really rejected the Bible because of uh, the biblical justification uh, of the African, African slave trade. So how this started was a curse that Noah put on his uh, descent that on his uh, sons of Ham. So Noah had, as we, you know, familiar with the Bible story, as a lot of us are, Noah had these sons and um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And when Noah got drunk um, and uh, naked, um, one of his sons found him and called the other sons, um, son Ham found him and called his brothers. Uh, and his father was very upset and saying that now, because he called his brothers to look at him in that state, that he was cursing his son's descendants. And so these descendants are uh, Canaan. And Canaan uh, apparently is meant to be black and that uh, could be a corruption from Semitic language, but that's what it came to mean. So it has been used as a biblical justification that, you know, black people, sh it's okay if they're enslaved because that was kind of their biblical destiny. That was their prophecy. So there's some Bible passages on slavery that, uh, that I found. Uh, there was actually a lot, <laughs> um, way more than I wanted to get into really. But um, so there's a few um, that really stand out and it actually really can show you how uh, slavery was used, um, how uh, the Bible was used to justify uh, keeping uh, slaves. And it says, one of them is First Peter, where it says, 
to that slaves are in reverent fear of God and to submit themselves to their masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Um, so a slave is completely supposed to obey their earthly masters in everything and do it not only with when their eyes are on you, um, when their eyes are on you, but to also do it with sincerity of heart and reverence to the Lord. So this was used in a very powerful way for um, slaves to obey their masters in, in everything. Um, and so it goes on with, the, with uh, those quotes. Now, there's also in the Bible inspiration for slaves to free them, to, to want freedom. Um, and so those things uh, were taken out, um, as I'll show you later. But there's um, justification for them to feel inspired as well. Um, so they are no longer um, in this state. Um, one of the most popular, if you've spent time in the church, is uh, Luke 4, where it says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. So these are some of the things that the uh, the slaves that that you know got wind of them because it there was a lot of effort for them not to get wind of such passages for uh, for them to want freedom. So there is a slave Bible, and uh, like I said, a lot of those passages that were meant to inspire slaves for to become free, they were eliminated. So in the original Bible, there was over a thousand chapters, and in this one, there was only two hundred and thirty-two. Um, and this was uh, used in the West Indies first, in the British West Indies. Um, it was very popular in islands such as Haiti and Jamaica, and then later it spread to the United States. So uh, there's evidence of, um, as I mentioned before, there's that connection to um, Islam and, uh, and slavery. A lot of the, uh, actually about a good number of a population of slaves that were brought to America at first were, were Muslim. Um, Muhammad himself was a slave owner, and uh, he wanted apparently better uh, conditions for uh, slave for slaves, and he really considered it. But he considered it a natural order of things. It was just how things go. Some people are slaves, and some people are slaveholders. And slavery continued actually in the Middle East for a very long time past uh, when it was abolished in by Britain, but they, they did not actually really observe um, any kind of better treatment. <laughs> um, I don't know how much better you treat slaves, but it was, it was still quite harsh. And the Arab slave trade continued um, even with some countries up until the 1970s. And they had to, they buckled largely to pressure from Britain um, there is, I didn't really, um, I don't own a Quran, um, but I didn't really see a lot in the Quran that directly spoke to, to the condition of slavery. Um, apparently, if you had set a slave free, it was very encouraged to set a slave free that you would find favor with God in doing this. Um, and uh, there was some, uh, a, an influential slave named Bilal that uh, was, had a very honorable station. Um, but there's not a, there wasn't a lot that I could find in specifically in the Quran in regards to slavery. Um, now, as I mentioned, there were black Muslim slaves in America, and uh, some of them, they they really didn't express this. I mean, I think they knew that it would be dangerous for them to do so, um, for them to kind of want to express their religion. Um, but there was evidence such as uh, the slave pictured here that when he caught himself landed in a jail in Charleston, South, Charleston, South Carolina, he wrote um, Arabic script on the walls um, that they, they didn't know what it was. They couldn't read it, but they assumed that it was verses from the Quran um, later on. Um, now, this is the door of no return. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, garrisons where slaves were held before they were um, in the transatlantic slave trade before they were loaded on boats. Um, this is some of the uh, some kind, some of the portals that they would 
uh, that they would leave from. And of course, you, you never went back. So they called them doors of no return. They started in the 15th century with the Portuguese. Um, in Ghana, there's a very popular one that uh, President Obama and a, a lot of uh, prominent people have visited. Um, and this is basically where they were held um, in separate quarters. Uh, children were separate from uh, uh, mother and father, and quite often they were shipped off separately. So you would have a child being sent off to France, you would have a mother being sent off to America, you'd have a father being sent off to Jamaica. Um, so this is how they kind of arrived uh, around the world. And um, the earliest evidence of slaves in America is disputed, but it's largely kind of believed that it is consensus was that it was uh, in 1619 in Virginia, and it was Portuguese ships that first brought them there. Um, so uh, it's, it's kind of disputable because there is also evidence that um, uh, in 1513, when Ponce de Leon was looking for the Fountain of Youth, um, he brought uh, slaves with him there as well. Um, so they were brought all over the world, as we know, um, even to Mexico, uh, Canada. Canada had slavery later on um, in the colony of the New France, but um, there was it, it was spread out throughout in Brazil, Cuba, um, a lot of other countries. Um, so, yes, there was slavery in Canada, um, and as I said, there was a colony of New France um, where they were where they were brought, and um, one of James Murray, which is a British governor of Quebec, um, he really believed that he really believed in slave right labor. He is quoted as saying, "Had I the inclination to employ soldiers, which is not the case, they would disappoint me, and Canadians will work for nobody but themselves." But Black slaves are certainly the only people to be depended on. So he was very entrenched in this idea um, of enslavement. And um, basically how that came to be was they replaced uh, indigenous people that were first attempted. They, their first attempt to enslave people was obviously the people that they found here, the indigenous people. But when that um, failed, um, they brought they, they tried to bring in slave labor, and, but there was really no crops uh, like sugarcane or cotton that required a lot of labor in Canada, like in the Caribbean. So slavery never really took hold as an institution. Um, we're all familiar with Harriet Tubman, um, who is a, a conductor on the Underground Railroad, which is how a lot of Blacks came to be um, in particularly Nova Scotia, but in Canada. And um, she helped 30 to 40,000 Africans, African Americans escape slavery. And they, um, this was kind of highlighted in uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, so some of the first settlements were in um, Windsor, um, Chatham, uh, Nova Scotia, um, and places uh, out west as well that we'll get into later. Did the slaves rebel? Yes, they did. Um, I, I know in some American textbooks, there is evidence, there, there's uh, passages that slave, slaves were basically happy with their lot. Um, they were workers. They, they, didn't, they didn't refer to them as slaves, but slaves in many instances were um, rebelling. The biggest rebellion, one of the biggest rebellions in the United States was that one by Nat Turner. And I believe a movie's coming out soon about this, but um, Nat Turner believed that he was hearing messages from God um, telling him um, that he was to uh, rebel. And he was, he, he got together with a bunch of other men and they, he's an interesting person because he heard this voice uh, from God. And then he heard a voice from God telling him to go back. He had escaped once. He heard a voice from God telling him to go back to his master, and then he rebelled by, uh, they went through the South um, community where they were, and they killed uh, entire families. Um, and then this fear kind of spread throughout uh, the South, and it resulted in a lot of uh, slaves losing their lives because of paranoid um, uh, slaveholders. But um, there was also rebellions in Jamaica. Um, 
the Maroons were a group of people that ran into the hills and basically the British let them establish their own communities. They would come down from the hills once in a while and raid um, plantations in British territory and then they would kind of go back. And so the British basically decided after a while to make peace with them. And so they were allowed to have their own kind of community um, in, in, in the wild, basically away from civilization and um, they, uh, they basically had, again, been uh, slaves had come to Jamaica when enslaving the indigenous Arawaks uh, didn't really work out. And uh, there was something called the Baptist War, which, uh, or the Christmas War, which began on December 25th in 1831 in Jamaica. And that was a big revolt as well. Um, that kind of inspired England to say, maybe we don't want to do this uh, slavery thing anymore. Um, Samuel Sharp was a leader of that rebellion. And um, he, uh, he actually um, became a very iconic figure. Um, then there's also the Haitian Revolution. Um, Toussaint Louverture is an interesting character as well. He um, led an insurrection, but he forced the slaves back onto the plantation when he became very powerful because he wanted to curry favor with um, European powers so he could basically take over Haiti completely from them. But Haiti was the first island to, uh, they were the first black population of slaves um, to gain their freedom. So eventually slavery was abolished in the British colonies. Um, there's an abolition act of 1833 um, where they freed more than 800,000 formerly enslaved people in um, throughout um, the British colonies, including Canada. Um, but anti-slavery views spread to Upper Canada and um, influenced uh, passage of 1793 Act to limit slavery, not to abolish it, but to limit it. And um, so it took it took many other years, it took many years after for slavery to be abolished in Canada. Now, Lincoln has been a big topic lately because of the insurrection in, in the capital in the United States, uh, where people now are digging back into the Constitution and seeing, well, what did it say? And um, so Lincoln, he was uh, very set on the idea that slavery was not necessarily um, a bad thing but that it was bad for the union. It was bad for America being a union. Um, but he wasn't 100% against it. Uh, he said, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so and I have no inclination to do so. But as we know, he later changed his mind um, in interest of America staying together. Um, so he had, um, so he had, a, 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 he had a administrator named Andrew Johnson. And so when Lincoln passed away, um, power went to Johnson and Johnson really believed in the states having their own uh, rights more so than, um, than with the entire country. He believed that they should have, uh, you know, the right to continue slavery if they wanted to, but with certain conditions. Um, so uh, Juneteenth became a day of celebration because in 1865, um, all these freed slaves were guaranteed 40 acres and a mule. So basically they were guaranteed land. Um, this was suggested by a group of black ministers in Savannah, Georgia, where um, they just wanted all these freed people to have somewhere to go um, and something to do. They never really got that, though. Um, and kind of another system of sharecropping, which is basically um, a lot of former slaves were forced into labor, um, where they basically they they were technically free, but it was kind of a form of indentured servitude. Um, so instead of getting involved in this, a lot of uh, people went to the north um, in search of employment. Um, so uh, by 1870, all the former Confederate states had been admitted to the Union, and this period of Reconstruction began. Um, they, uh, Black people won the right to vote. Um, a lot happened during this time, but it was repealed, um, you know, because of who 
became in who came into power after that. So um, this was kind of a, a really big setback. So then you have the movement um, in the 1960s, where um, there was a lot of amendments to the Constitution. I don't really have time to get into the details of all of them, but there was the 13th Amendment, um, where slavery was abolished unless you were uh, arrested and you were a prisoner, you were forced uh, for free, forced to do free labor. So a lot of laws uh, called the Black Codes were enacted to kind of ensure that um, people were rounded up if they were more than 10 of them together. Like a lot of these little rules um, where basically you could get thrown into jail for long periods of time was kind of another way where um, you know, you could can they could kind of continue to get free labor. Um, so as I mentioned before, the certain amendments like the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment kind of shifted the balances of power between the states and the federal government over periods over a period of time. Um, so depending on um, how that power of shift manifested was how it affected um, the free black population. Um, so uh, I'm just going to skip some information here about the amendments because it's quite a bit. Um, but basically, they had the Voting Rights Act because of all of this um, just confusion. Um, they had the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, where a lot of these little laws um, uh, and syst systemic things that were keeping the Black population, um, you know, in some form of servitude, were outlawed. Um, and so you have the right of citizens of the United States to vote. Um, you had um, a lot of freedoms that were granted, but um, they were still being fought for in the 60s and into the 70s. So an example of how freed Blacks um, kind of made a life for themselves after slavery, where they started their own little um, settlements. And one of them, most notably was called Black Wall Street. So in 1921, um, you have the Tulsa race riots where this, uh, such a community as this was destroyed. Um, it was one of the first instances where America bombed itself. Um, they did this with private planes um, where they destroyed this black community where they had built a life for themselves, basically. They had um, all the things that a community has, a newspaper, schools, barbershops, doctors, um, and that were all black owned. Um, this was started by a minor incident um, between a man and a white woman in an elevator. And it turned into this huge um, thing where there was a big ride and the community was destroyed. Um, so, um, there's other evidence. There's other evidence of uh, black settlements it, that were destroyed. Seneca Village in uh, what is now Central Park was demolished, um, and there was other settlements in North Carolina, um, all throughout the country, where it was basically uh, the community was demolished um, to make way for other other things. Now it happened in Canada too. Um, there's an area called Hogan's Valley in Vancouver. Um, where the first black immigrants came, they a lot of them worked on the railroad. A lot of them were porters um, uh, from Oklahoma that made a life in Vancouver. Um, Jimi Hendrix's grandmother lived in this area, and he used to come to this area to visit her um, before it was demolished. In Alberta, you have uh, black settlements as well, most notably, most notably Amber Valley. And uh, Amber Valley, again, was a community of African Americans coming from Oklahoma. And um, when the Alberta, when the uh, Canadian government was advertising land, um, this, made, this made its way to Oklahoma and it attracted a lot of uh, African Americans um, to this area. And one of the descendants uh, of this uh, settlement, he was uh, instrumental in creating the sea train. So we can thank him for great transportation. <laughs> um, this also happened in Saskatchewan, kind of the same story. They came from Oklahoma, mostly um, uh, free African Americans looking for land. Um, and Africville in Halifax, 
uh, that is probably one of the most well known because that uh, was a community of blacks that was actually carried on into the 70s until that was destroyed. And a lot of the community was moved to um, social housing. So this was a community of people that were independent and then um, a lot of them wound up um, in the social welfare system. And um, they didn't have any formal titles saying that they owned their houses. So um, these were just handed down and um, throughout their, for, throughout them coming before, when they came to Canada. So they didn't have any official titles. So they just moved them off the land and they wound up in social housing. Um, so in the civil rights era, you have, um, of course, we're familiar with uh, Martin Luther King and um, the Civil Rights Act that was passed in 1964. Um, so he became kind of the most popular voice. There was other voices, but he became the most popular voice with the bus boycott. Um, and that's kind of when it all started for that movement in 1955. Um, and then it continued until he was assassinated. Um, both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were assassinated under an FBI program called Operation Black Messiah that continued into the 1970s with the Black Panther Party to kind of rid any kind of possibility of the Black community having a, a leader that would, um, that would cause more of an uprising. So as I had mentioned, Malcolm X's father was uh, an early organizer in Marcus Garvey's um, organization. And um, so he became kind of the anti, um, the, an the anti uh, Martin Luther King. He was on the other side where he didn't want to integrate. He also met with a leader of the Ku Klux Klan at the time. Um, and they wanted to carve out a very separate but equal kind of, um, uh, existence and they were very anti-biblical um, because they believed the black church was holding back the black community and wasn't doing them any favors and that Islam was the way forward um, and black people living separately. Um, so we had a few incidents in, in the states where um, it kind of really spurred the wider community to galvanize around the black community and, and demand more civil rights. One of them is still alive today. Um, her name is Ruby Bridges. She was um, one of the first uh, little girls to be uh, integrated into um, a white school where the National Guard escorted her to school. Um, there's the uh, Alabama church bombing where four little girls died um, and Emmett Till, who was a 14 year old uh, boy that was beaten um, for allegedly for whistling um, at a white woman um, at a corner store. So these are incidents where the larger community, um, the larger American population said, no, this is wrong. Um, and we need, to, we need to all work together to uh, rid, the company, rid the country of these discriminations. Um, so into the 1970s, you have the Black Panther Party, which um, follows more the line of um, Marcus Garvey's uh, philosophy of self-determination, not necessarily separate separation, but self-determination. And um, so they started feeding, they started huge breakfast programs where they would feed kids in schools. Um, and they really felt that their activism in the community, much like the, um, the early um, um, black Muslim movements where they found that if they fed the community, they were responsible for making things better in the community because the government wasn't going to do anything. Um, but again, because of the same operation that took down Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and figures like that, they were also brought down and a lot of them were thrown in jail. Um, and they were a militant group. So they um, openly carried weapons. Uh, they were actually uh, legally able to do so in the states that they were in, um, but they eventually were taken down. And um, there's a new movie out um, about that as well. That's really good. So um, there was, as I said, a rebalance of power in landmark cases. And um, I kind of touched on that already. So I'm just going to skip over that. And um, so what effect does all of this have on uh, where uh, the black middle class is today? And in the 1960s, during that time, 
there was a lot of prosperity in the Black community as well. A lot of uh, uh, Black people were starting to own homes um, as they got jobs um, in, in um, cities and moved out of the South. There was a big uh, Black middle class that did grow. Um, however, because of prejudicial, pre um, prejudicial lending practices um, uh, for them to own homes or own a business, um, to get an education, there was a lot that was still um, structurally there that was holding back communities. So you did have a middle class that grew, but even today, there is a huge wealth gap um, as a result of a lot of these policies. Um, so it's in the, in the trillions of dollars um, as uh, we sit in 2021, the wealth that the, um, the white community holds versus the black community. Um, there's a practice called redlining that began um, with the National Housing Act of 1934 um, that still carries on today. It's a, house, a discriminatory housing practice. Um, so these are things that they have to overcome still um, in the United States. We don't have stats on these things in Canada, so it's a little more difficult. If there is, please let me know. <laughs> um, and a lot of uh, communities in Canada are calling for this kind of uh, uh, this kind of um, stats that are race based, so we can find these inequities. Um, and of course, we know that Black history is always still happening. We have uh, a lot of situations where now it's called to our attention inequities in the system, criminal justice system. Um, housing, employment, education, and a lot of these things are now being highlighted, which is fantastic. Um, in terms of human rights, uh, the common goal of 22 million Afro-Americans is respect as human beings. We can never get civil rights in America until our human rights are first restored. Um, so Malcolm X, this is a quote from him, he was very big on um, that's where he differed a lot with Martin Luther King. He really didn't see the sense of trying to integrate. Um, he wanted to actually bring the United States up for human rights abuses to the, uh, the, the court before the UN. Um, it's, it's never happened, but he felt that seeing uh, the situation in South Africa um, and other countries, how their racial inequities um, were brought before the UN. He felt that why was the US not brought up on the same, under the same scrutiny? And um, he didn't feel like this was um, something there that they could, that that's, he didn't feel that civil rights were very important in, um, in light of the human rights violations. And so um, as we can see today, it, uh, it, it, we can be positive, we can uh, say that we have come a very long way um, as, as a group of people. Um, this is John Lewis getting an award from, who was very instrumental in the civil rights movement. He uh, marched with Martin Luther King, he fought for civil rights, and here he is getting an award from the first black president. And as we know, we have the first black female uh, South Asian and South Asian female uh, vice president in Kamala Harris. Um, so that is hope for the future. And um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Kathleen. And somehow my video stopped working. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen, for this comprehensive overview of the pivotal moments of Black history. That was, that was great. Oh, let's go to questions now. Oh, there it is. What is the historic legacy of black slavery in Canada? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, it lasted a very short time. Um, as I said, there just wasn't the economic um, kind of the economic uh, I don't know what word to say. There wasn't really an economic need uh, driver for slavery to become a big institution in Canada, um, just because, uh, as I mentioned, the the labor the, the wasn't required for a lot of the things that we grew here um, or a business that we conducted. So it never really took hold as an as a as an institution, but it did exist for a short period of time. 
Uh, the news media shows African Americans and Canadians very often as Christians and all attending black churches. What percentage actually are Christian? A huge number, huge. Um, it's over 80%. So over 80% of African Americans identify as Christians. Okay, a, a comment question from Richard. In the 1970s, my Mormon cousin missionaries would promise Asian Canadians that if they joined the Mormon church, they would go to heaven when they died and upon arriving, their eyes would not look slanted. I'm not making this up when you comments about this. Uh, <laughs> yes, one of the things um, uh, that the Mormon church has been under a lot of scrutiny for is their racist past. That's quite recent. Um, uh, even as of 1970, Black men were not allowed to be priest holders, which in the Mormon church is actually quite an important thing that every man is able to do. Um, so I'm not really surprised by uh, something like that. Um, there's comments that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young uh, made about, um, about Black people that are uh, quite disgusting. Um, uh, to the point where Joseph Smith even believed that his black maid was continue to serve him in the afterlife. Um, so I'm not really surprised about a comment like that. A uh, question from Nancy. Why is it that stats and history regarding housing, economy, et cetera, is not clear in Canada? That is the, the theory there um, is, is that if we do race-based stats that we are being racist. Um, so Canada has a history of not wanting to be seen in that light. We are uh, seen as a peacekeeping country. We're seen as a, a, a mosaic and we respect people in Canada. So we don't, we don't, it's that kind of, we don't see color thing, which uh, we're learning now is not really the way to go. Uh, we need this information so that we can identify barriers and, and, and deal with them. Uh, so that is changing. Uh, there is more that's being done to uh, see what affects uh, each cultural community. Okay. From Rosie, where are your stats for that number of 80%? I'm not sure if that's related to the previous question. Rosie, if you want to clarify, unless, unless Kathleen, you know what she needs. Yeah, if you go on websites, like I got that information from uh, Pew Research. Um, it's called Pew Research, and uh, they give you information like that. Um, I believe the number was about 87%. Wendy's asking if there will be a copy of your slides available. <laughs> yeah, if you're interested, I can make them available. There's a, uh, for a talk like this, I do apologize. I had to really run through it. Um, there's a lot there, um, but if you want a copy, I can provide that for you. Great, thanks. From Tanya, historically in the Middle East, Arab world prisoners of war became slaves. So slaves were not necessarily only black people. How black people being enslaved more than other peoples? Um, well, um, that is because um, in the Arab world, there was, uh, I think in the transatlantic slave trade, and the Arab trade, there was millions, millions and millions of millions. Um, the, the numbers are in the slides, um, but that's why uh, as there's, there's no real war, war that could account for that many people um, being trafficked. From Christina, over last summer, we saw a civil rights uprising all over the globe, largely aggravated by police violence and the death of George Floyd knowing that we must continue the fight to access equal rights across Turtle Island, how does community resistance benefit this struggle and what are its limitations? Um, limitations of the struggle are the system. Um, and in, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to get through all of that. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of red tape. Um, nothing in government um, happens quickly. So uh, that's kind of the barrier there in terms of uh, better laws. Now it's interesting though, because after George Floyd and with deaths like um, Breonna Taylor's death um, and the protests, 
they seem to be able to get rid of certain things quite quickly, um, like no knock warrants or um, certain holds, um, things like that. But I think that's just with the uh, law enforcement, with the government, it's a lot more complicated and takes a lot more time um, to get through things. But I see in the states that Biden has, um, by executive order, he has uh, done some things where in the criminal justice system, he is not renewing um, federal, um, he's not renewing federal contracts for prisons, for private prisons. And that's huge because uh, the private prison system in the States is a big money maker. And that's where you have a lot of uh, unfair, very long sentences um, that mostly affects black and brown communities. So there are some things that are being directly done in a more expedient way, but ultimately, um, you know, to get through government, that is a big obstacle. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Simon, yes, Kathleen will, will share the slides, so we can definitely make them available. From Tanya, what is critical race theory? What do you think of it? Uh, critical race theory is, um, it comes from uh, those philosophy, those uh, ideologies that I shared about more self-determination, um, not waiting for the afterlife or the sweet by and by to uh, have a better situation in life. Um, it's the idea that uh, the Black community should be more, uh, more self-motivated, um, self-determinant, um, more autonomous, as far as I know. Um, uh, that's really the essence of critical race theory. Um, that's something I need to look into more. And that's become a debate in the this, this Southern Baptist Church because it's segregated. Um, you have Southern Baptists that are white that worships very separate, separately from uh, Black Southern Baptists. But um, they had a convention recently where uh, the uh, Southern Baptists um, were putting, were saying that theory was was not correct or they were in some objection of it. Um, so now there's been a split where some uh, Black Southern Baptists are want out and they want to split completely. So uh, there's something going on there. I have to look more into it. And Nancy's asking, I'm interested in your comment regarding Canada not wanting to see color and therefore statistics and historical information not being available. Uh, I'm thinking, where is the transparency? Does this affect any truth and reconciliation commissions? Uh, yes, it does. Um, uh, the Black community in Canada, they really want the government to do more in terms of determining what exactly in what way are we affected by um, systemic racism. We don't really know. Um, there's not really a comprehensive, uh, there's not really comprehensive studies or numbers uh, on a lot of these things. So it's harder for us to solve our issues if we don't really know exactly how it impacts. And the only way we're going to know that is um, if we kind of drop this, uh, this uh, idea that if we actually address race head on, that we are being racist. Uh, that's, that's not true. Um, so we don't want to, we say we don't want to see color, but uh, that is also a form of erasure that a lot of people of color don't want. We want you to see, uh, we want you to see us. And if we all blend into one, what are we blending into? We don't want to uh, not be seen. So this is um, part of the problem. The next question is, there were both black activists and white racists calling for segregation. From today's perspective, do you favor integration or a separate but equal approach? Um, I don't think separate but equal is practical um, at all. Uh, we have to live together. There's, there's just no practical way for uh, an entire group of people to be separate unless they're on a reserve system. Uh, like the indigenous population. Um, and there is really no reason that in today's day and age that we can't 
all learn to live together. We have to put in the work and um, try to understand each other better. And there's no reason why we can't do that. I think in large part, uh, we do do that, which is why um, Canada and America uh, are the countries that they are. We're, we're a great country, but we do have work to do. Um, and I, I just don't think us living completely separately makes much sense. A question from Susan. Do you find that Canada has a class problem versus race compared to the US? I would say classism, as far as I know, is more pronounced in Europe. Um, uh, for instance, in the UK, where there's a large Black population, I think there is that layer of class um, as well. And uh, that kind of compounds issues in, in the UK. But in Canada, I think it's just a lot of the systemic uh, and the states, I think it's a lot of this systemic uh, barriers and, and, and a group of people playing catch up, basically. Um, when you have been uh, in the states, when you have been enslaved for 400 years, it's, uh, it's hard to catch up to the rest of society, um, which will put you in, in a lower class. But um, there's also no more uh, place in, in, in the world where there's more black millionaires um, than in the United States. So some people, some individuals, they do uh, make it through. Like you got your Oprah's, you got your Michael Jordan's, you, you do have a lot of black wealth in the United States, but as uh, on, as a whole, they are behind, and and it's, it takes time to catch up, which is I think the case in Canada as well. So I don't think um, there's a class. We don't have a class slash caste system, but we do have those uh, systemic things in place where it makes it uh, more difficult for those groups to uh, catch up and operate with the with everybody else as as a group. That you have individuals that break through. But as a, as a whole entire population, we need to play catch up. And here's a follow-up question from Tanya. Is there a fundamental difference between oppression and discrimination against, against black people versus other minorities such as Jewish people or Asian people? I think yes, um, just because of the legacy of slavery. And I think once you put that into a certain lens and you put that under its proper context, um, into its proper context, I think that makes us different um, than any other group that is oppressed and, and discriminated against. Um, Asians are in a funny place because uh, they are, quote unquote, a lot of times referred to as the model minority. So they're the, they're the um, minority that Black people aren't. Um, they're, they're, they are uh, stereotyped as productive, uh, co cooperative. Um, those are a lot of the things that uh, Black people have historically not been characterized as, more like lazy or non-compliant or uh, violent. Um, so we have uh, more in that sense um, uh, that's harder for that's been harder for us to make it through. In 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 the whole dichotomy of white supremacy, the more adjacent you are to whiteness, um, is uh, kind of determines how you're able to break through these barriers. So because black people are so far removed from from that, it's 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 more difficult. Whereas if you have um, Latinos, Asians, uh, Jewish people. They're more, uh, they're more adjacent to whiteness. So they're going to um, have a, uh, I wouldn't say an easier time. I don't, like, I don't really wanna say that, but um, it wouldn't be as difficult for them to overcome their barriers and uh, uh, achieve more upward mobility in society. Here's a, a long question that I'll, uh, I guess I'll summarize it. If we better look after ourselves as Blacks, wouldn't that reduce the effects of racism? And uh, does it make sense to say that Blacks sell each other out? Uh, yeah, there is that problem in the Black community. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it makes me think of the uh, Toussaint Louverture situation where um, in Haiti, they had a real problem with that, um, where the mixed population uh, mulatto population of that were mixed black and white 
um, again, took advantage of their adjacency to um, the, uh, the main power structure and turned around and became slave owners themselves. Um, and yeah, so we still have that um, problem in the black community. I think it's uh, with the younger generation, um, they are seeing that that doesn't work um, and they're willing more to work together no matter what shade of black they are. Um, I think a lot of that is becoming old school very quickly. Um, and um, a, the mindset is more to be unified in the community and to, uh, to, to get things done. We're not gonna get things done if we're engaging in those um, silly, um, you know, silly separations of, of who we are. From Carol, my friends say that the basic problem is the lack of willingness to share resources, mostly economic power. Do you agree or have a thought on this? Um, yes, and I've become aware of how, uh, how much of a problem that is. Um, racism doesn't pay. And uh, in the States, the numbers are really, really telling. There is uh, 13, I became aware of a stat, I came across a stat where, um, and if anybody wants a source, I can share it with them, where $13 trillion does not flow back into the US economy as a result of um, a, a things like prejudicial lending uh, to black businesses. And that, that's just one thing. Um, so it's, uh, it's, really, it's really counterproductive. Um, there's also stats where uh, that'll show you how much, uh, trillions is a lot, $13 trillion is a lot, but um, I would like to know what the numbers are for Canada. I, I would like to see how that affects our economy to, uh, uh, you know, to be biased. From Susan, hi Susan. Thank you for an insightful presentation, Kathleen. A question, in the US, the criminal just, justice system disproportionately incarcerates black Americans into a for-profit prison system, which in turn contracts out prisoner labor to private enterprise. Is this a form of state sanctioned slavery? And what can be done to abolish this scheme? Yes, um, that's why I think Biden's executive order um, gives, um, sends a big message to those private, to the private prison system, uh, saying that this is not to be used as a, a kind of slavery 2.0. Um, and uh, the government, this is part of their effort for, uh, for uh, to end um, discrimination and also longer sentences for um, minor crimes. Um, a lot of the, um, the system there is different than Canada, where the judges are also elected. Um, so you'll find around that time, there's always uh, somebody that's acting tough uh, on crime um, to curry favor with the community. And usually that's uh, a target of uh, black and brown communities. From Christina, would you elaborate on the practice of slavery that continued into the 70s? Um, in, uh, in, uh, that's um, usually took the form of human trafficking um, in, uh, in with, with the Middle East. So those countries would uh, traffic individuals to, uh, a lot of them wound up in places like Dubai um, as, uh, you know, they would take their passports from them uh, and they would have to, uh, provide labor for families and richer, rich, rich Arabic families. Um, so this, uh, that kind of was a lot of what went on, uh, where they just kind of uh, took people's uh, papers from them and, and they had to, they were told they could work it off. Um, they could gain their freedom by, but they would have to do this um, free labor um, or near free labor um, in a lot of these places. How do I open a discussion as a white settler in Canada with my government, both local and national, to open the dialogue? Um, well, uh, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to sit in on um, uh, Doug's talk from, he made me aware of this, um, from Secular, from a, a secular Connection. 
um, he uh, said that they have to read the emails and they have to acknowledge them. So it sounds a little <laughs> soft, but uh, if you email and you get an email campaign going, um, they do have, they have to look at it. They have to acknowledge it. Um, and that, that can be a good place to start. Um, and also what I've been doing a lot of is sitting in when there's, um, I've been sitting in on a lot of the NDP's um, webinars and making my voice heard. Um, I, you know, show up for these things and comment. A lot of the time you are able to say something on these platforms. And now I have uh, members of the NDP uh, party contacting me. Um, uh, so that that's one way you can also make a difference. Just start showing up and, and, and commenting and um, seeing what you can get going in your own community. And on that note, Kathleen, maybe uh, uh, you'd like to share how people can find your Facebook group. Ah, yes. If someone um, so, is interested in joining the conversation. Yeah, so um, it's called Critical Black Thought Society. Um, I, I do try to keep it uh, for members of the Black community, just so it remains a safe space for them. Um, and uh, but you can you can certainly uh, take a look at us there. Um, and Secular Humanists of Calgary is uh, is an open group. Black Nonbelievers is a group for allies. Um, so anybody can um, anybody can join that group with uh, the Black community. And um, those are great spaces uh, where more information is is always shared beyond February. <laughs> thank you. A couple of thank you notes for your great presentation. Thank you. From Tanya, have the historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs played an important role in the anti-black racist movement? Oh, um, I think the biggest role they've played is uh, Kamala Harris is um, from an HBCU. Um, so uh, that's huge because that's, I think is the first big step in um, HBCUs getting recognition. Um, and yeah, they've, uh, they've always produced uh, leaders in the community, um, inventors, uh, just it really have been a, have been a great um, place of um, the Black community um, turning out leaders, um, thought leaders, scientists, I mean, everything you name it, they've been very important. A uh, question from George. Have you seen the 1975 National Film Board production Seven Shades of Pale about Blacks in Nova Scotia? Highly recommended. It's a pioneering study. I haven't, and thanks for putting that on my radar. From Maya in the, ch from the chat. Um, what are your thoughts, if any, on reparations and baby bonds? Uh, Reparations, I am all in favor for that. Um, I think in any way that um, uh, Black and Indigenous uh, uh, communities can be compensated um, for what's happened in their history uh, is totally appropriate. Um, there's a community that um, I think they're in, can't remember what state they're in, but they have used the tax dollars from cannabis um, to fund a reparations, um, to fund their reparations efforts. So they actually are in the process of giving uh, Black Americans in that community that have a legacy that they, they have to prove it, of course, but they have a legacy in that community um, and they are uh, in the process of doing that. Um, so it's, uh, it's important. I think it's, um, there's no amount of money you can, uh, you can, fling at a community to make up for it. But I think, I think it helps. Um, and it, it helps uh, the healing as well. It's, it's some form of recognition and compensation. Um, and I think it's important. And here's the last question. If there is research evidence to support the claim that Blacks sell each other out, it's a sweeping statement. Sorry, can you read that one again? Yes. Is there research to support the claim that Blacks sell each other out? Even now, it's a sweeping statement. Uh, yeah. Um, 
I, I wouldn't say that there's a formal study on it. I think it's just something uh, in the community where we look out for that. You know, we, we have, um, it, it's, it's uh, something that we have called a, a crabs in a barrel. Um, and it's been referred to by a lot of uh, Black people, especially that have made it um, in the community, so to speak, when they get to a certain level. And um, it's just, you know, I think it's just a general term for negativity, um, uh, for, for holding uh, Black people back that make it out um, of, of uh, the general situation uh, that we're in. So uh, it's just kind of nothing that's there's formal stats on, but it's more of a uh, com a thing in the community where, yeah, you know, you got to watch it because yes, okay, you can make it, but then um, there's these efforts to pull you back. Again, I, I don't think the younger generation is uh, is, is is privy to this, is, uh, is going to practice this as much. I see a lot of hope with them that they have to work together and they have to uh, push uh, each other forward and, um, and, and push people up uh, that, uh, that can lead us and guide us as a community. I think there's a lot less of that negativity that's going forward. And uh, just another question that came in. Have you heard of the book White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo? And if so, what do you think of its message? I have heard of that book. Um, I, uh, it's on my, it's on my to-do list to read it. Um, I'm familiar, I'm very familiar with the term um, and uh, the experience of uh, white fragility in, 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 in life, uh, where it refers to basically the, um, the inability for uh, a, a, a given person um, in the mainstream society to take criticism. Uh, to, to, like, that's where you get a lot of those comments where I don't see color. Um, why does it always have to be about race? Um, you know, you, 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 you're, you, you, there's been a black president. I don't know what there more there is uh, that we can do. So those kinds of comments um, are kind of speak to the fragility that it, it, it's uh, very dismissive to bounce, to bounce off of, uh, you know, or, or I wasn't there. I don't know why I'm responsible for slavery. I wasn't there. Um, those kinds of comments are meant to deflect um, and meant to, uh, not take responsibility for the perpetuation um, of an oppressive system. Okay, another thank you note from Janet. Thank you very much for the substantive presentation. Oh, thank you for your professional work on this topic and your efforts to share this knowledge. And uh, should we take a lot of one last question? If I need to challenge myself in my white superiority, should I seek out young or old? What is a Canadian source equal to and for white fragility? Sorry, can I hear that again? Yeah, if I need to challenge myself in my white superiority, should I seek out young or old? Mm. Is there a better generation, I guess, to have a conversation with about these, these issues? I would say yes, um, and I would go uh, with the younger generation on that one. Um, they're just more tuned in. They're more. I find uh, I don't want to. I don't want to criticize anybody uh, that's on the wrong side of forty. But uh, I mean, I'm forty six, <laughs> and I can say that I find more hope um, in, and I find that I've been able to through talking to my younger friends. Um, in the community uh, that I'm just able to, they taught me a lot. They've taught me a lot about, um, you know, what needs to be done to advance the narrative. I find uh, it's just a, a lot of people that are my age or older, they're kind of those, that generation that we were taught to, um, you know, just keep your head down. If you encounter anything, just be quiet. Don't, don't, ruffle any feathers you don't want to lose your job you don't want any kind of trouble um so that's kind of how we were taught um and uh you know that's not what this younger generation is saying um they're 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 demanding real accountability um and they're demanding that a real seat at the table 
And that's not something that um, my generation uh, and thought that we could, uh, thought that we had a right to ask for. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, talk to, so talk to people that, uh, you know, that are doing the work that are Gen Zers and millennials and they're a good source of, uh, of information and inspiration. Great, I think we've cycled all the questions. So thank you so much, Kathleen, for the very informative presentation. And thank you all listeners for your great questions. Uh, as we wrap up, I'd like to uh, mention that Humanist Canada is supported by membership and donations. So if you can and would like to contribute to our educational programs, including the webinars, you can do so on the website. Also, if you're not a member and would like to join Humanist Canada and continue the journey with us, you can do so on the website as well. And finally, just a quick announcement that our next webinar will take place on March 21st, as always at 3 p.m. Uh, please join us for a conversation with Teal Bondarov about the status of legislative prayer in Canada after the uh, 2015 Supreme Court's ruling that including prayer in municipal council meetings is unconstitutional. And you can find more information about the webinar on our website and social media platforms, as well as in the newsletter. And once again, thank you, Kathleen, so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. And have a nice day, everyone. <laughs>